tales for dark nights. The following performance is a second round entry in the 2017 Evil Idol voice acting competition. Voting is simple. Following the performance, simply click the thumbs up icon on this video if you'd like them to become a member of the team, or the thumbs down if you'd rather they not. Voting on this entry will conclude one week after the date of its posting. Good luck to all of our contestants. A few days ago, I was attending college to become a funeral director. Yeah, I know. I'm a weirdo. Yada, yada, yada. I've heard this from nearly everyone who asks what I'm going to school for. I understand the assumptions that come with this trade. But I wanted to help people in one of the most difficult times of their lives. I wanted to lend an ear to the grieving, and I wanted to show respect to the dead by helping the loved ones they left behind. It is kind of creepy. But death gives me a sort of calm. Death has never scared me. Until a few days ago. I'm nearing the completion of my degree, and I've already been accepted as an apprentice at a local funeral home that I will not name. I don't want any negativity to be pointed at them. It's not their fault. But something really strange has happened. It has shook me so much that I don't know what direction I'm going to take my career. So, as a funeral home apprentice, you really just clean. A lot. I would get to shadow my mentor when he would meet with family members to go over the actual arrangement processes casket choices, cremation, etc. But again, my days normally involve dusting, vacuuming, and cleaning the morgue area. I'm a little morbid, I guess, because the morgue and preparation area does not bother me in the slightest. Mopping up bodily fluids and embalming fluid was just another day at work for me. My mentor always complimented this quality and joked that he hoped nothing followed me home. This never bothered me, but... Maybe I should have taken it a little more seriously. Mr. Mason's body arrived at our funeral home on April 24th, 2017. It was a Monday, and after a few morning classes, I arrived at the funeral home around noon. I walked into the side entrance of the building with my purse on one arm and a sub sandwich in my opposite hand. I walked down to the morgue as there were lockers down there for the few employees to put their personal belongings in. I was going to take this time to hurriedly finish my sandwich and then see what my mentor had lined out for the day. As soon as I opened the locker and it let out a quiet, metallic creak, my mentor called my name from the morgue. I let out a small sigh and headed in that direction with my sandwich still in my hand. I had just taken a huge bite before entering the room and I was trying to chew as quickly as humanly possible. But when I saw the body on the preparation table, I stopped moving and even stopped breathing for a few moments. I looked up and met the smiling face of my mentor. Today I'm going to give you a quick run through of embalming. I finally swallowed the bite of sandwich I had in my mouth and tossed the rest of my lunch into the trash can at the entrance of the room. I nodded and gave a meek smile, but I kept my eyes on the body on the table. Now, this person didn't suffer a violent death or anything. The man on the table was not horribly disfigured or unrecognizable. Trust me, the gunshot victims we've gotten are awful and very sad. Or the worst was a kid who'd been hit by a car. This client was just a very elderly man who I only could assume expired due to natural causes. As I stated, he was very old and frail. A white cloth was laid over the bottom part of his body for what I hope is obvious reasons. His upper body showed extreme signs of age. Dry, wrinkled skin riddled with age spots made up a majority of his complexion. He was very thin and maybe weighed a hundred pounds soaking wet. 
Along his side, I could see a large bruised area that was due to blood pooling, which led me to believe he had passed while in a position on his side. His face was skeletal, with deep-set eyes along jutting temples and cheekbones. The skin on his face looked so thin, I thought his cheekbones might rip through the skin if the smallest amount of pressure was applied. He was completely bald, other than a few wisps of hair scattered at random on his scalp. His eyebrows were so light that he almost looked alien. The most unnerving thing was his mouth. It wasn't in a horror movie toothy grin or a gaping maw. It was more of a grimace. His lips were pulled up, and he seemed to be clenching his teeth almost in a snarl. His gums were nearly white, and his teeth seemed too large for his gaunt, thin face. His teeth had a brownish-yellowish tint often seen in cigarette smokers and very heavy coffee drinkers. His eyes were, thankfully, closed. But I knew the eyes that peered at me from under those eyelids were blank, and by now had a milky film over them. Poor old thing lived alone, other than a caretaker that would stop by every day. He was wheelchair-bound and had a heart attack. The caretaker found him on the floor as he was trying to crawl towards the phone to call for help. My mentor sympathized while preparing the embalming fluid IV. The rest of the day was quiet. After the embalming lesson, I forgot about Mr. Mason after he was secured in his unit in the morgue. I really hoped his funeral would be on a day I was off. I just couldn't get over the strange expression on his face. I understand the events surrounding his death were tragic, but why were his lips completely tucked under themselves like that? I shuddered as I contemplated this while walking to my car. I stopped close to my car and sighed as I realized my keys were likely at the bottom of my purse. I started digging through my purse frantically as I thought, whoever thought that women should start carrying purses is stupid. I then stopped moving and turned to look behind me. I had heard someone right near my ear whisper my name. I was expecting to see my mentor pulling a prank. Honestly, any human standing there would have been comforting. But to see nothing made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. My hands touched my keys and I must have clicked the unlock button on the fob 20 times as I sped walked the rest of the way to my car. I threw my purse in the passenger seat nearly left in the driver's seat, slammed my car door and pressed the lock button three times for good measure. I started my car and glanced in the rearview mirror to prepare to back up and get the hell out of there. As my eyes grazed over the rearview mirror, I saw a shadow in the back seat. My head spun around to peer into the back seat and I was once again met with nothing. I let out a big relieved sigh and started to chuckle. I think I need to take a day off. My drive home that evening, although feverish, went well and I arrived at my house without any more strange occurrences. The evening's events had me so shook up I couldn't even enjoy a shower. I felt like a kid who watched a horror movie while their parents were out to dinner. I would start to put my head under the running water and just as I would close my eyes I would hear a noise and quickly peer out of the shower curtain to find nothing but my dog laying just outside the bathroom door. He was guarding me as he had done from the day I brought him home. Angus was my shadow, my big 70 pound shadow. He met my gaze and wagged his tail and it lightly tapped the floor. I got out of the shower after being interrupted by my own paranoia every few minutes. I walked to my bedroom and only turned off the lights as I passed by the switches, but I left the kitchen light on for good measure. I spun around quickly when I heard Angus let out a low growl from behind me. He was peering back into the kitchen and was backing up slowly towards me while still letting a growl escape his meaty jowls with each step. I walked towards the frame of the door and he followed close behind with his head low and emitting a growl. What is it, buddy? I asked in a barely audible whisper. He ran into the kitchen barking. I almost tripped as he ran by me and I sighed as I saw a mouse run under the stove. I had a few from time to time and made a mental note to get glue traps the next time I was at the store. Come on, let's go to bed. You scared the crap out of me, I said chuckling as I patted Angus on his wrinkled head. 
I woke up a few minutes before my alarm in a cold sweat. The dream I had had Mr. Mason's dead, shriveled face in it. It was just like a gif image of him opening and closing his mouth, as if gasping for his last few breaths. His eyes were deep-set and milky white, and his lips were still stuck underneath themselves. Inside of his mouth was a dry black tongue that waved back and forth as he continued to gasp. It was hypnotizing, and then he stopped and just stared at me with those dead, silvery eyes. I swung my legs over the side of my bed and continued to heave in deep breaths. I felt like I was suffocating, but I knew it was just a small panic attack and it would pass. I had these in normal day life outside of terrifying dreams. So I just focused on my breathing, put my hands over my eyes as I sat on my knees on the side of my bed. I decided it best to not dwell on what had happened and continue with my normal routine. As I was walking out my door, I saw a strange stain on my carpet by the entryway. It was a black stain with just a tinge of red. It almost looked like old blood. I shrugged it off and thought I had something on my shoes the night before and didn't notice. I would clean it up when I got home. The drive to work was unnerving. I had assisted with many funerals before and had a few very tragic mangled clients. But Mr. Mason was just stuck in my head. I just didn't know why. The day at work went pretty quickly. I only had one strange experience. I was in the morgue area alone working on a little old lady who had passed away from natural causes. I was finishing up her makeup with no supervision when I heard a sound come from the area we put the bodies. I froze and listened. I could hear a scraping noise and what sounded like a haggard breath. All at once it stopped, and I chalked it up to my mind playing tricks on me. It scared me to death, but with no more events occurring for the rest of the day, what could I say it was? That Mr. Mason was alive in his refrigerated tomb? I didn't mention it to my mentor, but asked if I could take a personal day the following day. I hate to say I lied about why... But I did. I blamed it on a paper at school, and my mentor happily obliged. On the way home, I stopped and grabbed some much-needed beer and headed home to relax. I just wanted to forget about Mr. Mason and move on with my life. I sunk into the bubble-filled tub and deeply inhaled the lavender-scented steam emanating from the water. I pulled a bubbly hand from under the water and brought the cold beer bottle to my lips. I sighed and laid my head back and closed my eyes. Angus was at his usual post, laying with his head down between his paws. Then I heard Angus growl. My eyes shot open, and then I chalked it up to another mouse. I told him to leave it, but he kept growling. Then he stopped and let out a nervous whimper. Now this freaked me out. I jumped out of the tub and threw a towel around my soap-riddled body and started walking to the door of the bathroom. Angus had been slowly backing himself into the bathroom, whimpering still. I paused the music that was playing from my phone and quietly shushed Angus. I heard a weird scraping sound that I just couldn't place. It sounded like something being dragged across the floor. I peered out of the door of the bathroom and my jaw dropped. I rubbed my eyes and looked into the dining room again. Coming into the light from the kitchen was a figure on the floor. As the kitchen light hit it, my mind finally realized what the sound was. Mr. Mason was dragging himself across the floor. I know, I know that's impossible, but I'm telling you what I saw. I'd only drank half a beer, so I couldn't blame it for what I was seeing. There he was, his mouth leaking a dark blackish red liquid. He would reach out with his skeletal arm and pull his body forward and then repeat. His lips were still curled under themselves and his milky eyes were open very wide. I pulled Angus into the bathroom and locked the door and stepped back. I could still hear the dragging sound and it soon stopped outside the bathroom door. I could hear him gasping for breath and then I heard a scratching on the bathroom door. I could imagine his long, thin fingers slowly traveling down the wooden door. Angus was whimpering and backed up to me to get as far away from the door as possible. 
Between the breaths, I could hear words, but I couldn't quite make them out. Please, leave me alone, I murmured between my short panic breaths. I leaned into the door and listened. A breathy, gurgled voice was coming from the other side. It took a few times, but I finally made out what he was saying. Not alone. He just continued to say it over and over. I put my hands over my ears and slid down the door and started to cry, Leave me alone! I started to yell. I don't know how long I sat in the bathroom, my hands over my ears, but I noticed that it was suddenly eerily quiet. Angus nuzzled his nose into my hand, and I gingerly rubbed his head. I opened the door just to crack while holding back tears and was met with nothing. I started to breathe heavy and almost started to hyperventilate. I was relieved, but I suddenly felt like I was having a panic attack. I closed my eyes and started to count down from ten, only focusing on my breathing. And after a few seconds, my breathing started to slow. I got dressed and ran to my bedroom with Angus trailing me. As soon as we were both in, I slammed the door and locked it. I kept the light on and turned on the TV to hopefully drown out any noise. I woke up not sure when or how I fell asleep and my room was dark. The light and TV were both off. Angus was standing up and was almost standing on my head and he was growling. Then I heard it. That deep, rattling breath. Then the scraping sound. I set up and started to go for the lamp on my nightstand when in the darkness I saw the outline of a thin, long arm rise up from the foot of my bed. I started to panic. I wanted to run, but my body wouldn't move. The phrase frozen with fear is a real thing. I wanted nothing more than to stand up, jump to the foot of my bed, and leave the house, but I couldn't. The arm had lingered in the air for several seconds when it suddenly shot down and grabbed my ankle. I started to pull away, but the thin hand felt like it was cutting into my leg. The second hand followed the same motion. As soon as the second hand touched me, I felt my body contort. My head shot back deeply into my pillow and my chest rose upwards, putting me into somewhat of a backbend position. Then a memory started to play in my mind. I felt like I was watching a movie. It was a little hazy, and I saw Mr. Mason sitting in his wheelchair watching the news. He was obviously in poor health, but he was very alive. He wasn't scary. He was just a frail old man. Suddenly, he grabbed his chest and fell to the floor and started to seize and gasp for breath. He started to crawl over towards the phone, which was on the other side of the living room, and was a rotary phone to show his age. The front door opened and a woman in scrubs entered, his aide. And instead of doing what you would expect and run to his side and help him or call 911, she, she just stood there. He was gurgling out, help me, over and over and she just stood there. She was watching him die. She walked over to him and sat in the chair that was facing him and started to laugh. The lady who was supposed to care for people was watching him die and was enjoying it. Help him! I started yelling in my head knowing that this was a vision of sorts and my actions couldn't change the present. His aide got up from the chair, grabbed him by his frail frame and drug him further away from the phone. She laughed and sat back down in the chair. Mr. Mason looked directly at me, and shortly after, his eyes went glassy, and I knew he had passed. I came back to reality, and the tears were streaming down my face. I could feel the hands around my ankles, but the grip had loosened. I sat up and leaned over and put my hand over the thin, skeletal hand that held my right ankle. I'm so sorry, I repeated through tears. I felt the other hand leave my left ankle and set gently over my hand. Thank you, a breathy voice answered. I woke up to the sun shining into my window and I felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Mr. Mason just wanted someone to know that he didn't die alone. 
He wanted someone to know that his death was not peaceful and quiet. He wanted someone to know his suffering. I called my mentor and told him that a family emergency had come up and I had to move back home several hours away from St. Louis and I wouldn't be able to continue school right now. He tried to make arrangements for me, but I declined. I knew I had found a new calling. Even if I couldn't change what happened, spirits wanted someone to hear them and I was one of those people. I contacted the aid agency I had saw on the lady's scrub in the memory, and it didn't take much to find out everything about her thanks to social media. I wrote a note and put it into her mailbox. It was short and sweet and only said two words. I know. I figured that the paranoia would be better than her going to jail, and I'd like to think that Mr. Mason thinks so too, as I haven't saw him since that night. I have a new calling, and although it's scary, I have to use this gift. I'm writing this in the middle of the night, and I hear a faint knocking on my bedroom door. I think I have a new client. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via either a thumbs up or thumbs down vote. New entries will be posted throughout July. Be sure to tune in and vote for each of them and help decide who becomes the next evil idol. In the meantime, turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.